Welcome, everyone. Um, got a confession to make right off the start. Um, I have never been involved with a community league. However, I have taught this session twice before to the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. Uh, I have also been involved, as Kyra mentioned, with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of not-for-profits and charities over the years. So I have a fair amount of knowledge about how organizations like this work and uh, how uh, the boards of directors interact with the, uh, the organizations themselves. So just a, a question for you. How many here sit on the boards of your community leagues? Okay, so we got a fair representation, which is really good. And the others who do not sit on the boards are probably in some sort of a position where they're influencing what goes on in the, the uh, organizations and uh, has a vested interest in the success of the organization. So today I want to talk to you about uh, a number of things. <clears throat> the plan of attack is your role as a director the barriers for financial participation because finances seems to be the hardest thing for people to get involved in. Oftentimes they're mission based, they're organization based or they're, they're specific uh, driven by a particular function or program. How does financial reporting work, especially in an organization like yours? What's in a set of financial statements and how do you use financial statements to improve your organization. And then finally, just a few what to watch for's when you're uh, sitting on a board or in a position of influence. So let's talk first about this word called fiduciary. Fiduciary duty. Um, I liken it to the word trust, but also the golden rule. And the golden rule is not the rule that sometimes comes up as those who have the gold make the rules. It's you would treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. And that's how, as a board member of an organization like a community league, you would actually uh, run, help to run the organization, is you make sure that your decisions are based on what's right, not necessarily what will pass or what will do, but what is right. Down in the States right at the moment, having been involved in the financial planning world for many, many years, uh, the uh, ju uh, Department of the um, Judiciary or the Attorney General or something like that down in the States is actually passing laws right at the moment to ensure that financial planners have a fiduciary responsibility to their clients because as a financial planner you could make a recommendation to buy this product which is a mutual fund or something like that which might be okay for the client but it enriches you more than this product over here, which is also appropriate for the client, but doesn't enrich you as much. So it's not only doing the right thing, it's doing the appropriate thing for the clients. And the same as a board member acting for your organization, you have to show a fiduciary duty, which involves a number of things. You have to be honest and you have to act in good faith, which means that whatever you're doing, you're doing for the betterment of the organization itself. Confidentiality is often very important. In my uh, career over the last uh, 47, 48 years, confidentiality has been paramount. So I haven't been able to talk about certain clients, give out their names, their, their uh, information, uh, just like you wouldn't necessarily want to give out certain types of information that were perhaps endemic to your organization. Uh, and not necessarily needed to be known by outsiders. Okay, so confidentiality is often uh, a part of acting in good faith. Uh, conflicts of interest. <clears throat> Again, going back to the financial planning aspect of things, if, uh, if I'm doing something to better myself uh, as opposed to, you know, better the, the client, uh, that's a conflict of interest. If you're making a decision on a board for the community league, which is going to benefit you, there's a conflict of interest. And you have a duty to declare, I have a conflict of interest. And uh, you might want to recuse yourself from actually making a decision in a situation like that. 
Compliance with the uh, organization's rules. Of course, every uh, community league, just like every not-for-profit organization, charity and so on, has a constitution, set of bylaws. Those rules have been put in place over a number of years, have been refined over the years and so on. So it's important as a board member that you know what those rules are and that you make sure you follow them, that any of the decisions you make, any of the thinking that you have uh, is not in conflict with those rules uh, of the organization. Finally, compliance with the law. Uh, there's probably two legal statutes in the province of Alberta that affect community uh, leagues. First one would be the, uh, the trust, the Alberta Trust Act, Trustee Act, which says that if you're acting in a position of trust for others, that you can't be doing a number of these things that I've just mentioned, okay? And it spells it out in legal jargon and so on. And it, just, it says that you can be held accountable if you are in a position of trust. It isn't just necessarily board members, it's if you're in a position of trust of any sort, okay? So it covers a lot of different ground, everything from estates to, you know, working for an organization which you're, you're giving, given some responsibility and uh, sometimes uh, money or resources. <coughs> the other act that's uh, applicable would be the Societies Act, because most of your organizations would be incorporated under the Societies Act. There are a few organizations that are incorporated under uh, different statutes, but Societies Act would probably be the most common one. And the Societies Act spells out a lot of rules and regulations with regard to what you need to do uh, and how to act and how to comply with the law. So. Uh, it's important as a board member that you make sure that you're aware of all these things. You don't necessarily have to be the, uh, the wear all and be all of, uh, of knowledge, but you have to be aware that these things are going to affect how you are viewed uh, from a number of, a number of uh, sources. Um, it's also important, I think I'll mention at this point, that it's, it's infrequent that any board member of an organization would be taken to task legally for decisions made as a part of the board. Every board should have some sort of insurance policy which covers the decisions that are made so that if ever you're uh, found to be wanting and that uh, a lawsuit is launched and so on that there would be some sort of insurance policy to come in and safeguard the board members. But every board member is responsible and could be held liable for decisions that are made. And I'll give you one example. Um, I was sitting on a board, of a very large foundation uh, down in Toronto um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was a um, multi-billion dollar um, foundation. And I got off the elevator uh, for a board meeting one morning. Uh, we were staying at a very nice hotel down there. And this guy walks up to me and asks me, he says, are you uh, Scott Montgomery? And I said, yes, I am. And he gives me a, a piece of paper and he says, you've been served. So I opened it up and I was being sued for $5 million. <laughs> it was <laughs> a, a little bit of a shock. So uh, I went for breakfast uh, with a couple of other directors and w we'd all been served. Each one of us was being sued for $5 million. And it was a not-for-profit organization. It was not uh, an organization was there to make a profit. So uh, fortunately, uh, it was a disgruntled employee who was um, a visible minority and he'd been passed over for some position um, advancement and uh, thought that he was hard done by and that it was um, because of his race that uh, he was being passed over. So he sued the board. Every single one of them managed to find a lawyer to do that and so on. So. Uh, short work was made of the lawsuit, but it, it shows you that it can be done. So you have to be aware of that. Stewardship of resources, okay? This is the reason that we're having this seminar today, is uh, you guys as board members or people in positions of responsibility within the leagues have resources that belong to the leagues which you're responsible for looking after. So you have to protect them. You have to protect them to make sure that they're not squandered, they're not wasted, they're not misused. You also have to oversee the financial reporting of those resources to ensure that the resources are being used appropriately. We'll get into that uh, in a minute here. 
why don't people get involved in looking after the financial resources of an organization like a, a community league? Well, oftentimes it's because they fear what they don't know, especially when it comes to accounting and uh, finances and all that sort of thing. If you haven't got a background in it, if you haven't been educated in it and so on, then it's kind of a black hole and it can be a little bit intimidating. Okay? So oftentimes, over the last many decades, I've been appointed to various boards and I'm the accountant, you know, and oftentimes I am made the treasurer or the vice president of finance or something like that because I've got the accounting designations. I spent a lot of time in all board meetings educating the board members on what the financial statements or what the financial information was that was being presented to them. I also knew what to look for and I also knew how it needed to be presented and so on. So I spent as much time educating my fellow board members uh, about things financial as I did in helping to prepare the financial information itself. So if there's an accountant on board, all the better. Make sure that that person is a source of uh, knowledge for all of you who are sitting on the board. I'd rather focus on the organization's mission. And God love you, you have to have people who do that. You have to have people who are program oriented, people that say, yeah, we need a, a kid's ice program or we need you know, new playground equipment or whatever it happens to be. You have to be uh, mission organized and mission uh, focused in many instances, but you can't disregard the financial aspects of, of running the mission. So if you're mission organized or mission uh, focused, that's fine, but you still have to be aware of the finances. I don't understand accounting, it's too hard for me. Let's harken back to my first point about uh, the accountant, okay? If you don't have an accountant on the board, then you're gonna have to rely on the bookkeeper or whoever is doing the books or management of your organization to explain a lot uh, to you. That's fine, but you have to ensure that your mind is open to be able to accept the information and education that's being offered as a part of this job because it is a part of the job. And if you say it's not my job, well, um, then perhaps you don't belong on the board. It's important to actually be there. Um, my notes say, um, although delegating the financial statements work is okay, the directors must protect the organization's assets and oversee the financial affairs. The board has to satisfy itself that the information presented by management reflects reasonable perceptions of reality. The auditor provides an independent opinion as to the fairness of the financial statement presentation and the results of its operation in accordance with generally accepted accounting principle and generally accepted auditing standards. So again, the questions come up in previous sessions, well, we can't afford to have an audit. We're, you know, very slim finances organization, so what do we do about an auditor? Well, I think the Societies Act says that you, you must have an audit, but it doesn't actually describe how you have an audit, so you could have a couple of uh, board members actually go through the books, and it's board members obviously that would uh, have to understand how the books worked and the information that was being presented and so on, and then they would have to try and be as independent as possible as they presented to the board as to their findings. But uh, it's important as well that uh, an audit periodically be done. So if you can't afford it once a year, maybe once every three years, you have an independent uh, accounting organization or an accountant come in and take a look at the financial state or the financial statements of the books and so on to make sure that things are working as they're supposed to work and areas for improvement and where the numbers can be relied upon. One question. Mm -hmm. If you have a board which looks at, uh, doesn't understand the, about the financial part, it's not really interested in knowing if you have any, um, I guess, news or stars or other things that you provide to them to kind of explain to them that this is not something you can ignore. And it's, I don't have anything specifically to refer you to, but I'm sure if you uh, Googled um, responsibility of director, director's responsibility uh, on not-for-profit organizations, you will find lots of resources. You usually get a lot of hits. Uh, back when I actually prepared this uh, presentation 
two years ago, three years ago. Um, I just I googled something like that in, in looking for information, and I had hundreds and hundreds of hits. You know, so not-for-profit organizations, especially in North America, are very very popular. So you're going to find lots and lots of information on that. Uh, so that you maybe uh, once you got all your various hits, then you can refine it down to director's liability or director's responsibility, that sort of thing, so that you can come up with information as to uh, what the consequences of not being responsible might be. Okay, for every organization, there are basically three, three entities, three groups that have to interact for purposes of running the organization. There is the board, and the board oversees management itself. It oversees the reporting processes, the actual financial statements, and it takes a high, if you like, uh, 40,000 foot level look at the organization. It oversees policies, procedures, and processes. Okay, It isn't actually supposed to be doing the actual work of running the organization. That's the board's responsibility. Management's responsibility is to run the organization, to implement those policies and procedures. It's also responsible for preparing and overseeing the preparation of the accounting and financial statements on a monthly or periodic basis. The auditor, as I mentioned earlier, is somebody that can be brought in who's independent, who reports to the audit committee or the board itself. I chaired the audit committee of that multi-billion dollar organization that I was talking about, and that was a, a very uh, interesting um, experience for myself because I had, I think, four or five people on my audit committee. I had one of the largest accounting organizations in the world doing the audit, and I had a board of 24 people that I had to report to, very powerful people and so on. It was a little in intimidating to begin with, but it was very, very meaningful. And if you could just bring it down from that level down to the, the league's level and so on, the same ideas and the same processes, the theor theory is the same, okay? It, it doesn't go away just because it's a small community league. Um, the auditor, because I was an auditor for a number of years, um, the auditor's role is to go in to test the accounting system, and oftentimes, uh, I, uh, again, in small organizations and so on, there's not going to be much of a system, and there's not going to be that many controls. But you do have to have controls such as maybe two signatures on your checks, if you're doing that, uh, making sure that the bank is reconciled on a monthly basis, making sure that financial statements are presented monthly or periodically, and that they are meaningful, that uh, the board does meet with the accountant or the, uh, the people doing the, the accounting and the financial statements. And we'll get into some of the questions you need to uh, act uh, or ask when you're uh, dealing with those types of, uh, of people. Okay, financial reporting. There's two types of financial reporting. There's what's prepared within the organization itself and is given to board members and other people who may be interested or may be eligible to receive the financial information. And there is external reporting, which is done for a number of different uh, reasons. We'll get into both of those. The first one is that management, as I said, is responsible for running the organization and preparing financial statements and keeping the books. They are also responsible for doing a budget. And the last couple of sessions that I've taught uh, on this, it's, it's interesting how many organizations don't do budgeting. You know, they say, well, you know, we kind of know what we're going to have in terms of revenue, we kind of know what we're going to have in terms of expenses, and we hope that we make it through the year, you know, in the black. Okay, that's not valid budgeting. Budgeting is actually taking those programs that I was mentioning a little earlier, the mission-based things, and saying, okay, what are the revenues that we're going to derive from those programs? What are the uh, expenses that are incurred to earn those revenues? Uh, and are we in the red or are we in the black for each one of those particular programs? Uh, or you may take 
a, a broader view and say, okay, we have revenue from this source and this source and this source during the year, and we have these various expenses, and there's the bottom line at the end of the year. It doesn't really matter. The more detailed it is, the better management you have in running your organization, the better idea you have of how to run the organization and whether you're going to be successful or not. So budgeting is very, very important, and if you're going to have financial statements, have them compared to budget. Okay? Because on a monthly basis, you can say, oh, we're off budget here. Why are we off budget? Well, maybe it's a timing issue. Maybe the revenue hasn't come in yet, or maybe the expenses uh, were incurred ahead of time, or whatever it happens to be. But you should always have your budgeted numbers there. And if you're doing financial statements throughout the year, then you can prorate the budget to ensure that the budget numbers are appropriate for the numbers you're seeing uh, on a current basis. Management prepares the monthly internal financial statements with comparisons to budget and projected results to year end and last year's actual results. So if you're having uh, financial statements prepared on a regular monthly or periodic basis and so on, let's make sure that there's prior year's results there because oftentimes you'll be uh, surprised at numbers that vary greatly from the prior year's uh, numbers that have been presented. I just got made treasurer of a not-for-profit organization and um, the, <laughs> the treasurer um, for the last six years is a nuclear physicist. He's a PhD <laughs> who, who taught nuclear physics at the University of Alberta. Uh, back the previous slide where I said uh, accounting's too hard for me, it was too hard for him so he made up his own <laughs> means of <laughs> I'm doing accounting, and it, it's been quite the uh, bowl of spaghetti that I've had to wade through <laughs> in terms of trying to put it into, uh, into uh, a meaningful form. And his comments to the board on a regular basis have been, uh, we got enough money to meet our expenses. Everything's fine. And the board accepted that, which I am not prepared to allow the board to accept now. I am making sure that they get information. As a matter of fact, I went back six years and I prepared six years of comparisons um, to show the trend on certain types of revenues and expenses. And I've also, I had prepared a budget because I was the president of this organization the previous year and I had done my own budget for, for the year. And, and so I just prepared the financial statements actual compared to budget. And it was surprisingly close and uh, a few of the eyebrows in the room went, hmm, <coughs> maybe this guy knows what he's doing, you know. So. Um, so, those are the uh, financial statements um, that you have for internal. External financial reporting. You may have to provide financial reporting to funders such as government or donors who have contributed, especially if there's grants involved or something. There's certain types of uh, requirements to provide financial information to them. You may want to supply information to the members of your community league in a different form than the board receives information on a monthly basis. It may just be, you know, contributed to the ice hockey program or to the social program or to the, the uh, uh, place that sells candy bars and coffee and so on. The, you know, that sort of information might just be uh, what the members of the organization need. If you have loans, or you have any other types of uh, uh, stakeholders in your organization, they may require information about your organization in a different format than what the board is receiving. And finally, provincial federal authorities, such as uh, Canada Revenue Agency, when it comes to reporting such things as uh, your withholdings for employee salaries, um, GST, and all that sort of thing, there are certain forms that need to be uh, completed by the accountant or treasurer to comply with those requirements. So those are external financial reporting. What's in a set of financial statements? Well, because I've spent my whole career uh, dealing with financial statements and financial reporting and so on, it, it comes as second nature to me, but I find oftentimes that people don't know what's in a set of financial statements. So the first thing you need to know is that there's a, a balance sheet. And a balance sheet just states the dollars that you have in the bank, the receivables, the fixed assets, the machinery, equipment, bricks and mortar that you have as an organization, those are called assets. 
They're either current assets or fixed assets. And then on the other side of the balance sheet, to help balance it, you have what you owe. So there's accounts payable, there's uh, payables to government organizations like CRA, GST, et cetera. Um, you may owe uh, money to the, uh, the bank as a loan. Um, you have payables, of course, for the various expenses that you uh, incur in running your organization. And then when you take your total assets minus all your liabilities, hopefully there's an amount left over. And that amount left over would be considered your equity or your excess of assets over liabilities. It's what you have left in your organization after however many years you have been running that organization. If the liabilities exceed your assets, then you are what they call insolvent, okay? And you better address that ASAP. Perhaps there's some money coming in or something coming in that's going to get you out of that situation, but you can't stay insolvent for long without uh, something being done. The income statement is also known as a statement of earnings or operations or a statement of revenues and expenses. And it basically outlines the money coming in versus the money going out. There's various ways of accounting for that, uh, especially if you're if you did uh, membership to your uh, community members uh, for the year and each uh, community member had to pay say 20 bucks, um, 20 bucks might get recorded in the month that it's paid and be good for the year. But if you've got say 500 people who did that and you've got a uh, uh, thousand bucks coming in as a result, then a portion of that thousand dollars should actually be reflected each month over the whole year. That's called accrual accounting. Likewise, if you prepaid expenses like your insurance, if you paid uh, insurance on your facilities or your equipment and so on, and the uh, insurance premium was uh, $1,000, that $1,000 might get reflected in the month that it was paid, but the expense itself is actually, should be amortized over all the months. So when you're doing your accounting, it isn't necessarily correct to show that $1,000 expenditure in just one month because it's good over the whole, the whole year. That's called accrual accounting, and that's something that you should ask uh, your accountant or bookkeeper if they're doing when they're reporting on a financial statement basis. Notes are the last part of what goes into financial statements, and uh, because I spent the last almost 20 years in the investment business, I spent a lot of time reviewing financial statements of large public corporations and uh, potential investments for my clients. I've read financial statements that are sometimes 100, 150 pages long. And the vast majority of those financial statements are notes. And the notes are supplementary information that helps to explain various aspects of the income statement or the balance sheet or the schedules and so on that are, are along with it. There's nothing wrong with notes being uh, appended to your financial statements of your league, uh, especially if it helps to clarify. For example, the $1,000 in insurance that we just paid, uh, you know, is shown in this month's expenses and therefore has reduced our net income for the year. Okay, they're not reflecting a cool counting. That's fine, at least you'll understand it. Okay, questions to ask on the balance sheet. What do we have in cash? And if the accountant or bookkeeper says, okay, we got you know, $10,000 in the bank, that's fine. Is that $10,000 reconciled? Does it show outstanding checks? Does it show outstanding deposits? Or is that just the balance that they pulled off the bank statement that you received in the mail the previous week? Who owes this money? Okay, do we have a full listing of all the receivables or organizations or people that, that are um, supposed to be paying us money um, over this period of time? If so, how old are some of those receivables? This receivable here is three months old. Are we ever going to collect it? If it's determined that it's a bad debt, then you write it off. You don't show it as revenue and you don't show it as a receivable on the balance sheet. Those are questions you should be asking. Um, what is the makeup of our prepaids? I told you what a prepaid was, such as the insurance or 
if you're paying uh, lease payments on a, uh, a photocopier, for example, you know, you might pay uh, a year in advance or six months in advance. Those should be amortized over the, the period, not necessarily written off in one month. If you're fortunate enough to have investments, such as guaranteed investment certificates or any types of uh, uh, funds or anything like that, then uh, you got to make sure you understand what's in those investments and how are they accounted for. Is the value of those investments that's shown on your balance sheet, is that a current value? Is that what you paid for them? Has, have the investments gone down in value? Have they gone up in value? What's in investments? It's not likely that uh, a lot of the organizations have um, such as yours have investments, but they, they may have if they've been around for a while or if they got a, a windfall in a grant and the money is sitting there and needs to be invested until it's actually expended. Fixed assets. Those are the ones that I said are equipment, um, machinery, uh, desks, computers, uh, the building that you're in, uh, playground equipment, um, the hockey rink, uh, the snowblower for the hockey rink, whatever it happens to be, those are all fixed assets. And what is the policy of putting those on the balance sheet? Okay, do you put them on at cost? And if you put them at a cost, are they still shown at cost or are they being depreciated? Because equipment, machinery, everything wears out. So there has to be a policy of depreciation, which is writing down the value over a period of time. Is the policy of writing it down appropriate for the assets that you have, you know? And if so, get management or the accountant or the bookkeeper to explain why it's appropriate and what it is. Who do we owe money to and for how long? Have we been dragging our payables? Uh, if so, that could be indicative of a bit of a cash flow problem that you might want to address. Um, do we have any other debts that are not reflected on the balance sheet or anything that we owe for that uh, we should be addressing. And how are these balances compared to prior years? Can I ask a question? Yep. Just about the fixed assets, because that's something that we don't, we used to for a while have everything fixed assets listed in our books, and we don't have it anymore because mm -hmm. it's just out of the touch. So yep. it's all removed from our books. How would we go about putting that back on? Would we go to an is it appropriate to them after every three to five years to have them? I think it's, it's um, a matter of determining what the value of those assets are. We have appraisal. It's not the same Okay. So there's uh, an idea for a note. Okay. okay. Put the, whatever the asset is at a dollar. So it's just a nominal value on the balance sheet. Note number four. Okay. You go to note number four. We have this asset, this asset, and so on. And we paid these amounts of money for them in these years. Okay. Appraisal says that the assets are worth this amount of money, okay? Um, because I was a, a treasurer of a church at one point and um, the uh, volunteers over the 40 or 50 years that had preceded me had written off a lot of the assets, but in fact, we still had a church building which had been appreciating in value. It was probably worth you know, a lot more than it was sitting on the books at. So I, um, I chose at that point to actually put the asset back on the balance sheet for purposes of internal reporting to, to the, uh, the board that ran the church, uh, just to show them, to give them an idea as to what the value of the uh, operation was, even though when we reported externally, it had been written off for quite some time. Yep, as long as there's in information there, that's a good point. I mean, that's, that's a good question to ask. You know, if you've got assets that are not reflected on your balance sheet, you know, where are they? You know, why were they written off? So. Even if they're written off, would you still leave them there showing your cost and accumulated? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, even if it's down to zero. Yeah, yeah. But like I say, because uh, not-for-profit organizations have volunteers over the years, not all volunteers are knowledgeable about accounting and accounting procedures and, and write-offs and depreciation and amortization and all that sort of thing. Sometimes you get a mishmash of all sorts of different presentations. So if you get somebody in there who says, well, I, I would like to ensure that the board at least knows what the real picture is, they can put it back on 
at cost with a total accumulated depreciation coming down to zero, that's fine, you know. Uh, but you would also have in that note uh, or a note to it saying our depreciation policy for equipment was 20% declining balance or, you know, over straight line uh, over 10 years or whatever it happened to be. What that should be doing is cluing the board members into whether or not you should be accumulating money uh, for purposes of rebuying or, or purchasing new equipment uh, because some of it's worn out, you know, and if it's shown on the books at zero, <laughs> You know, then that's something that might gobsmack the board. You know, in two years' time, all of a sudden we need a brand new computer or we need a, a brand new facility to house our snowblower or something, uh, and, and we didn't budget for it. We didn't have money ahead of time. You know? So we've talked about some of the... Uh, uh, some of the things for uh, the, the statement of earnings, uh, let me go back here. Okay, um, cash flow is obviously important, so the board should always be uh, addressing itself to ensure that there's enough cash coming in to keep the operation viable for the year. Um, salaries and benefits, are they reasonable? I, um, I used to audit um, a number of bingo associations in town and um, uh, there's another point on here, I think, um, actually it'll be coming up in questions to ask, but I'll give it to you now, that uh, the manager of this particular bingo association hired her daughter um, to run the um, um, concession, so selling candy bars and uh, daubers and, uh, and coffee and pop and all that sort of thing, as well as to do the books. And uh, because she had several different uh, functions, she was getting paid a fair amount of money. And uh, when I did the audit, I questioned the, the value of the money that was being paid to this uh, daughter of the general manager, uh, whether they were getting value for her abilities and, and her efforts. Um, and we also found, um, after doing some digging, that uh, she was actually pilfering. She was pilfering funds, she was pilfering inventory from the concession. So there was a number of things that uh, were red flags to me as an auditor, but they weren't necessarily asked by the board members of the Bingo Association. So it took them a couple of years to recover from the defalcations that were uh, committed by this particular individual um, after I had identified it as an auditor. Do all of our expenditures make sense? If any of the expenditures that are listed on your statement of income and expenses uh, uh, is something you don't understand, you ask the question and the answer that comes back is vague or you don't understand what they're trying to say and so on, it doesn't make sense, keep digging, keep digging. There could be something there that needs, uh, needs to be addressed. And again, comparison to budget because budget is very important if management's doing their job. This is how we see our programs unfolding over the next year. This is how we're doing compared to our, our management plan, our programs for the, for the year. How do you improve uh, your organization? Well, you question, you probe, you talk, you make sure you understand. So whenever you're having your board meetings or meetings of smaller groups and so on, you make sure that you're engaged. You're there for a reason. People have put you in a position of trust and it's your fiduciary responsibility to ensure that you understand what's going on. So are the financial statements complete? Do they mean something to me? Are they late? I've been involved in organizations where the financial statements are deferred, 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 and you don't get financial statements until several months down the road, and when you do get that financial information, the information that presented is meaningless because it's so old, it doesn't make any sense in the current context. So make sure that the financial information is being presented on a timely basis. Is it compared to budget? How are we doing versus management's program? Are it compared to last year's figures? Do they make sense on that basis? Are they in compliance with our organization's bylaws, our operations, our plans? Um, 
I had one uh, participant who came up to me um, last year, I think, and said, well, we have several groups that run different functions within our community league. Uh, we actually ask each one of them to present a plan to the board so that each one of those plans comes together and management then accumulates it and puts it together in a plan for the year. And uh, obviously management would be vetting those um, anticipated revenues and expenses or whatever they happen to be for the each program or the mission, as we called it earlier. Uh, and then they present that to the board and say, okay, we put all these programs together and here's all these programs and here's the administration costs of running our organization. Here's the bottom line. And so the board in that case may be acting as a, an audit committee of a whole or a budget committee as a whole saying, well, we can't spend that amount of money there and we think we're going to have to raise prices here in order to augment the revenue and so on. So when you have the board engaged in, in a uh, task like that, it, it helps to run the organization much better because everybody's engaged, everybody knows what's going on. You've got your people that are mission focused along with your people who are financially focused and so on. Okay, what to watch for as a board member. When you're meeting with your uh, management, uh, when you're meeting with uh, people who run your various programs, when you're meeting with fellow board members, when you're meeting with people that have some sort of an interest, a vested interest in the organization itself, these are things that you might want to make sure you've got your spidey antenna up watching for. Negative attitudes. So somebody is saying, God, I, I, I just don't think this is going to work. This, this is terrible. This is awful. Or so-and-so over here is just a total screw-up. I don't think we're going to be able to do what you know, we need to do. Negative attitudes are uh, indicative of things that perhaps are going off the rails within your organization. So watch for negative attitudes. Evasive answers. I mentioned earlier, you know, if you ask a question and the answer you get doesn't satisfy you, don't just accept it because you think you might look naive or ignorant. Make sure you understand it and then accept the answer. If you've got evasive answers, perhaps they're being evasive for a reason. So when I mentioned that the bingo association where the manager's daughter was uh, doing a number of things, she was giving evasive answers all the time. She was cooking the books. She was pilfering inventory from the concession. She was pilfering money. Unhealthy trends. So if you're watching your financial statements on a monthly basis or uh, on an annual basis and you see that revenue is declining in a certain area or expenses are going up in a certain area or certain things are happening, that should not be happening, you need to ask about those and you need to address them. Because if they're not in accordance with budget and management's plans, then you need to address it. Otherwise, you're going to end up with an unhealthy organization and you're going to have all your time devoted to dealing with an unhealthy organization. Wastage, expenditures with little benefit. Um, if you see expenses on the financial statements, again, that don't make sense, or why are we spending money here uh, because we're not getting any revenue out of it, we're not getting any value, we're not getting any benefit out of it, so on, then again, you need to address that sort of, uh, sort of an expense line. Suspicious activities, well, um, you know, there's all sorts of things that could be suspicious activities. Somebody who's being evasive, somebody who has access to the premises and coming into the premises after hours, you know, no particular reason why they would be coming in after hours, but they're coming in a, whatever it happens to be. You know your own organization, you know what might, would make sense and what might be suspicious. Unexplained variances from budget. So when you get your financial statements from your accountant or bookkeeper and you've got a budget line and the number on that budget line is significantly different than the actual number, then I think you need to uh, get an explanation and find out why. Large differences in prior year's numbers. Uh, goes without saying, and like I've said to you, the auditor's feedback. So even if you have an auditor come in periodically, like every three years or something like that, or you have a couple of board members who actually go into the books and, and do a, a very detailed analysis and so on, get the feedback. Find out where some of the problems are, some of the uh, control weaknesses, you know, for example, um, 
somebody signed, there's two signatures required on a check to, from, from your organization, and uh, one of the signatories just signs a whole bunch of checks. So the treasurer or the bookkeeper can just put their signature on it and make expense. Well, what kind of a control is that? There isn't, you know. When you're signing, when you've got two signatories on a check, both signatories should be signing at the time the check is prepared, and they should be looking at the support for that check. So if there's a bill or an invoice or, or some sort of a payable voucher, uh, and then they should be initialing that as well so that every expenditure is, is uh, made correctly. So auditors' feedback is very important. Oftentimes auditors will give a uh, letter to management and they'll say, you know, this is what you need to do to improve your organization, and those are very important aspects of the relationship with the auditor. Okay, so probably run over time, but um, a lot of material that I've covered, uh, probably about uh, 20 years worth of uh, accounting courses and finance courses and so on. <laughs>